This is very informal. Uh, I'm not here to perform for you, although I'm a performer. I'm not a guru. Somebody said we're in the midst of a guru. Guru, uh, the meaning of guru is something very large. I'm a teacher. I, I'm a student of the dance and a student of India's arts. And that definition is applies to me as it much as it applies to any of you. So, I'd like to just start by saying that consider this situation, that in India, when after our independence, when the new schooling systems were begun, there was no place for a sports teacher. So I have we have some form. The form is divided. The body is used differently by each art form. In Bharatanatyam, we have simple sthanaka. We call this sthanaka. Sthanaka is to stand. So it's a kind of, but it's not a displacement of weight. That would immediately become the first position in Odissi. In our form, it was very much like the temples of South India, very linear, very structured in very mathematically sound ways. So there's a vertical line, a horizontal line. So this was our first position, a half sitting position, a full sitting position, extensions of the leg on the sides. These became the basic, uh, you know, grid on which you place the, the dance that you will do. Now, if you ask me, what does it mean? Abstract movement means nothing. It doesn't, it's not meant to mean anything, it's supposed to just be beautiful if it's done beautifully, not beautiful if it's not done beautifully. Basically that's the bottom line. It's like how somebody speaks to you. If they speak to you rudely, it's rudeness that you get. If they speak to you sweetly, you get some sweetness. So this is the only difference. Abstract movement is meant to just be. Now, there is the, the second pillar on which our art forms are based, is a very, very typical to India uh, strength that we have, and that is the language of the mudras. So now I'm going to do some things with Pataka, and you're going to tell me what I'm doing. I should be good at it if I want it to work. So I'm saying, you. It's fundamental to human behavior. Body language is a language. The way you sit, the way you look at somebody, the way you address somebody. Am I speaking to you? When my, we were very, very tiny, my younger brother was very, very small. My father used to ask him in the morning, did you brush your teeth? And he would go, yes. <laughs> my father would say, go and brush your teeth. <laughs> because he knew he was lying. So this not being able to make eye contact, not talking to somebody with, you know, looking at somebody and talking. The strength of any art is when it speaks to you from the heart and it speaks to you straight. Oh, see this, see this. Not, you know, not uh, trying to say things which don't really make uh, meaningful contact and con conversation. So. These many, many mudras that I showed you, all of them, for instance, Brahmari, it was, it was a tough one. I, did, I didn't see too many of you doing it. You roll in the first finger. This Brahmara means what? Come on. Brahmara is a bee. So 
we know that these are words that are taken from the Sanskrit language. Sometimes they actually, for instance, if I did this, it means a house. If I do this, it means a bed. So there are, there are things that naturally come. We have double hand gestures also. For, let me say, tell you something very simply because there, it would be wrong on my part to only talk and not, not show you something. But let's take the first of the double hand gestures. Anjalischa. Anjali actually means what? Anjali could mean an offering, it could be a greeting. Now, look how beautiful our culture is. <coughs> and how the body of the singular, what we call the Jeevatma, each of us is a Jeevatma, we are, we are an Atman that, that uh, lives on, on earth, that has life, as opposed to the Paramatma, who is, a, is, is an energy beyond oneself. Let us not take it as a Godhead, you can take it as a, as a, as a goal as a light at the end of the tunnel. That could be Paramatma. Because at every given point in life, you are moving from one point to another. There is no time when you do not aspire. Even a little child, if they, uh, if one minute they are in their mother's lap, the next minute they aspire to stand. After that, they aspire to take the first step. This constant movement between one point and another is basically human. And this is the goal. The goal for you now happens to be completing this course. But it won't be the end of your goals. Then you have another aspiration. Then you have another aspiration. Some of the aspirations are of the mind. Some aspirations are of the heart. Some aspirations are of philosophical nature. Some are spiritual in nature. So these aspirations continue. They never end. This is the connect between this, what I call the Jivatma and the Paramatma. But uh, to get back to what I was saying, I was saying that any of these mudras in, let us say, Anjali Hasta, look how beautifully they've connected this Jivatma to the Paramatma. They've said that in the body, there are certain areas which speak a certain language. So, if I were to say pranam to you, I, I place it in front of my heart. I say pranam. If I was to do it in front of my forehead, this is to the, an obeisance to not just the guru, the guru in the real term, but to all knowledge. Because you have enlightened yourself in this area. So you say pranam to that energy which you have received, which has opened up this nature of your man. And if I hold it above the head, you know, it is to that area which is not defined, which could be anything, the area of imagination, the area of, uh, you know, where, where art goes, where poetry goes, which is limitless. Now, suppose I'm, I'm doing a movement and they say, yato hastas tato drishti. In dance, we say, if you, wherever the hand goes, the drishti must go. So, if I'm placing my hand here, my eye follows. Yato drishti tato mana. Look how beautifully they've said. Yato drishti. So I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you. My eyes should be on you. Yato drishti tato mana. My heart should also be there. Not only my eyes, but I'm thinking of something else. Yato mana. Yato manas tato bhava. If your heart is there, bhava will be born. Expression will be present. Yato bhava tato rasaha. That means where there is expression, there there will be that intangible rasaha, which we say is rasa, is also when you eat food you have rasa. That means you have enjoyment of the taste of that food. But even when you talk to somebody, there is rasa. That is a connect which is an intangible connect. That you looked at somebody in the eyes, that you spoke with your heart, that your heart feeling was born and where there was feeling, some connect happened and understanding happened. That is what we aspire for in dance. That's what we aspire for in a simple conversation, even if you're passing somebody by, not the way people pass by in <coughs> New York City where, you know, you don't touch and you walk very fast, but there's no connect. There's literally people are afraid of looking at each other. But in our country, you see, you go and park your, in the, in the, a misty morning, you go and park your car, 
at the railway station or airport, Aste Sahib, Kaise Hai, little bit of conversation, little bit of chiting, yeah. this, this naturalness, this wanting to bond, this is the strength of our nation and this is what uh, I think the arts can give you. So now, without saying anything more, because <coughs> the theory of dance is very, it's almost, uh, for us it's a science, uh, and a maths and everything that's complicated in it. But I'm going to do a little item for you. It uh, describes the dance of Lord Shiva. You know Nataraja is the god of dance, Shiva is the god of dance. Ananda Nadvinam Padan is a beautiful Tamil lyric where the dance of Shiva is described very simply. It's not a very long piece. It's, uh, uh, and it describes all his attributes. Can, any of you just tell me some of the attributes of Lord Shiva? Some of the symbols that adorn him. Come on. It shouldn't take so long. He has the third eye. Uh, by the way, uh, in Many philosophers will tell you that it's not only Shiva who has a third eye. If you have the strength and power of his individuality, all of us have a third eye. It's, a, it's an, the eye that sees. It's the eye that not just opens up and burns people, though he burnt Manila. When they say burnt, you know, it's you must not take these these sentences to be physical, physical truths. They are much beyond that. It's just the power of his concentration. It's what you can do to to somebody who errs or somebody who does something wrong is that with our <coughs> meditative power, just with our concentration, we can make something change. That was, it was the transformation of Manmatha into whatever. That's the long story. But what I'm saying is the third eye, these are only symbols. He has a deer, a man in his, in one hand. This is a symbol. Why would, why would he take a little humble deer and place him right up on his shoulder. What does the deer symbolize for you? Let's, let's just talk about it. Out of all the animals, do you know that a little baby deer is the most timid? When uh, the deer itself puts his leg on a little twig or agar wo to so his own body, you can see the skin reacting to the placement of the foot on a, on a little twig. They are that sensitive. That sensitive creature, humblest of creature, he takes and says, I will protect you. Then he has Agni in the other hand. Agni is a symbol of what? You all know because this is science. Fire purifies. Fire is a purification, uh, an element that purifies. It transforms. It, again, it's the element of transformation. So like this, there are many, many uh, symbols. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I hope you will recognize some of them. He has a Damaru in one hand. What does Damaru symbolize? The beginning of sound. The element of the spand. As soon as you are born, there is spand. Spanda. Spanda is when uh, a heartbeat, the pulse, the whole, all life is made up of uh, some kind of pulse. The pulse that I have may be different slightly to yours or to anybody else's, but we all, and everything is in uh, what you call contraction and expansion. This is constant. As we breathe, that's happening inside us. As we, as we, uh, as I'm speaking to you, all our hearts are beating. This is life. This is, and time is passing. And this, the, the larger things are in movement and stars and the planets. It's all, Amazing, and that's what Ananda Natamidam is about. It, it describes the Ananda, the joy with which Lord Shiva danced, and really it symbolizes the joy of the constellations and how they move around each other in motion and are all suspended in the air in a kind of dance of the elements. <coughs> Oh mm -hmm.
something even better. She says, you take my bimbi, you take my chui, you wear my bangles, you give me your pitambaravastra, you give me your more mukut. Let me be Krishna, you be Radha. Then she goes further and says, the way you worry me, you stop me on my way. I have to, I'm carrying the pots on my head. You carry the pots of water on your head. I will stop you. Let me break the pots. Let me be Krishna. You be Radha. And in this very simple exchange of what is really child talk between two people, what is expressed by these great bhajan uh, poets was the highest philosophy and that was the Advaita. That we are all only one Atma. There's no, there are no two Atmas. We are the Advaita. There is no difference between us. In truth, we are all the same. And in this very simple poem, she is expressing that there is no difference between me and you. Let me submerge my identity in you and you submerge yours in mine. This is what true love is about. This is what true giving and taking is about. So I'll do this bhajan and then we'll open up for a little <coughs> question answer. Uh, now this is pure Abhinayat. You'll see that I'm not using pure dance, abstract dance to enhance it. It's pure expression. Tell me, tell me.